Before Anonymous and the Low Orbit Ion Cannon Tool, in the earlier days of the internet, of hacktivism as a concept and DDoS as a protest tactic, one group took on the US military and managed to walk away relatively consequence free. All of this despite having triggered what was thought at the time to be the first counterattack by the US military on civilian computers ever. Today we're going to look at what events led directly to the Floodnet protest, the history surrounding it, and what really happened next. This is the history of the Electronic Disturbance Theatre. Before we get into this history, we need to discuss a few terms to make sure we're all on the same page. Firstly, Usenet. An in-depth discussion of what Usenet is is kind of beyond the scope of this video, but in essence, Usenet is a worldwide, distributed, threaded discussion system available since 1980, before the creation of the internet as we know it. A sort of precursor in function to web forums, but more decentralized and with less oversighted administration than most forums. Usenet plays a role throughout this story. We also need to define denial of service, or DOS which in terms of computers is an attack in which the perpetrator seeks to make a machine or network resource unavailable to its intended users by temporarily or indefinitely disrupting services of a host connected to a network, which is generally the internet. Or as Ricardo Dominguez, founding member of the Electronic Disturbance Theater, describes it. Can I have information? Website goes, yes. Okay, here you go. Hello, can I have information? Yes, here you go. Hello, can I have information? 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 Can I have information? Can I have more, more, more? And then finally the server says, I can't give out any more information right now. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves, though. The 1990s were when the World Wide Web, browsers, and the phrase surfing the internet were born. The 90s also saw the rise of loosely coordinated denial of service attacks against targets chosen for political purposes. In 1994, we have arguably the first of these coordinated, politically motivated DOS attacks, conceived of and backed by hippies, ravers, a nightclub promoter, and countercultural luminary Timothy Leary. The Zippies, as this group were known, attacked UK government email inboxes and online infrastructure to protest a new British law that set out to criminalise outdoor raves as part of a crackdown on what the Conservative government of that time saw as an outbreak of antisocial behaviour. The plan was to spam huge volumes of email to UK government addresses. Instructions to participate were distributed via Usenet posts, with lengthy statements deriding the new criminal justice bill. This email bombing campaign would result in various issues for UK government computer and communication systems and problems for Morph, the San Francisco Bay Area Bulletin Board service that was hosting an email account associated with the Zippies. They called their online civil disobedience campaign an intervasion or virtual invasion of Great Britain, and chose as the day for this intervasion to commence Guy Fawkes Night with self-proclaimed cyber Commodore Timothy Leary promoting the protest actions at San Francisco rave nights. This is all, however, a topic for a future Hack History video. A year later, in late 1995, Italian art collective the Strano Network coordinated an online net strike against the French government in response to French nuclear testing on the French Polynesian island of Marora. As Strano Network's call to arms at the time stated, We will go on with our demonstrations with any means, using all technologies, always respecting the law. These political fellows, which do not take into account people's needs, will understand very soon the real power of new information technologies. The net strike attack itself was organised by members and supporters of the Strano Network online, who went about providing a list of French government target websites via various net activist email lists and Usenet groups, encouraging participants worldwide to visit and hit refresh on the home pages of each target website repeatedly at a set date and time. This manual DDoS tactic was more recently replicated by Thailand's F5 cyber army hacktivists in 2015. This technique for performing a DDoS attack may seem quaint to us now, but it actually fulfills a number of important functional requirements. A browser refresh style protest necessarily involves a large group of people to succeed, replicating in some basic way attendance at a mass physical protest, but online. Hitting refresh from a browser is accessible to people with pretty much any level of internet literacy, and it isn't particularly strenuous for people to perform. No command line kung fu or need to download potentially risky software. For most people in the 90s, downloading anything on dial-up was a very lengthy, painful ordeal anyway. Lastly, a website is a virtual manifestation of a potential target. A website is a representation that people can conceive of easily and see on their screens. If it becomes non-responsive, participants can see this from their browser in real time, as opposed to merely imagining the operations of some dusty, nondescript server grinding to halt in a dimly lit data center somewhere in the world. We can see a clear progression in tactics and organization here. Strano Network, and to a lesser extent the Zippies, created stage directions for a method of performative, cooperative political action online 
that blurred the boundary between audience and participant, producing an act of virtual civil disobedience that grabbed the attention of 90s politically active netizens. On the 1st of January 1994, a declaration of war against the Mexican government was issued by the Zapatista Army of National Liberation, who were fighting for indigenous rights. As the first declaration of the La Candona jungle states, We have been denied the most elemental preparation so they can use us as cannon fodder and pillage the wealth of our country. They don't care that we have nothing, absolutely nothing, not even a roof over our heads. No land, no work, no health care, no food, nor education. The Zapatistas, or EZLN, sought to highlight injustices and fight for solutions to the issues facing Mexico's sizable indigenous population, many of whom live in southern states rich in natural resources but find themselves suffering extreme poverty as well as social and political marginalization and victimization. As quickly as it could, given Mexican networking infrastructure of the time and the relatively undeveloped nature of the net itself, the EZLN adopted the internet as an outlet for political content and as a communications medium. EZLN leadership understood the inherent power of allies in a switched-on international activist community and the potential for cross-pollination of revolutionary ideals. Meanwhile, before the creation of the Electronic Disturbance Theatre, Ricardo Dominguez was a part of an artist collective called the Critical Art Ensemble. This is important because in parallel to the EZLN's internet outreach was the gradual development of the Critical Art Ensemble's theoretical, philosophical, practical and tactical discourse on the topic of electronic civil disobedience. The Critical Art Ensemble was founded in 1987 in Tallahassee, Florida, with its focus to be exploration of the intersections between art, critical theory, technology, and political activism. In 1994, the CAE published a paper called The Electronic Disturbance. A small but coordinated group of hackers could introduce electronic viruses, worms, and bombs into the data banks, programs, and networks of authority, possibly bringing the destructive force of inertia into the nomadic realm. The less nihilistic could resurrect the strategy of occupation by holding data as hostage instead of property, by whatever means electronic authority is disturbed, the key is to totally disrupt command and control. The authors contended that humanity has found itself at a sort of crossroads with the creation of the internet and the popularization of video as an accessible mainstream medium and all of the changes that these developments have brought to global power structures. In Electronic Disturbance, published in 1994, CAE provided an examination of the limitations not just of technology, but the revolutionary potential of the utilization of that technology itself. Throughout this paper is the observation that hackers of the day, and what the authors termed the technological elite, are insufficiently politically minded. In short, the CAE posited that a new form of revolutionary activity or resistance is needed, that old methods of resistance were severely in need of a modern tactical overhaul. They saw this need as increasingly vital given the ever-growing links between people's existence IRL and the constructs of data that represent us in online databases, and the opaque processes by which that data is accumulated, catalogued, and analyzed. We can also see a sort of theoretical scenario of politically motivated hacking as performance art that precedes in a way not just the eventual formation and actions of the electronic disturbance theater itself, but also the Strano Network's net strike that would take place a year later. Hackers placed on stage with a computer and a modem, Working under no fixed time limit, the hacker breaks into databases, calls up her files, and proceeds to erase or manipulate them in accordance with her own desires. The performance ends when the computer is shut down. In 1997, the paper Electronic Disturbance was followed by Electronic Civil Disobedience and Other Unpopular Ideas, which was in part a rebuttal to critiques that Electronic Disturbance was short on practical and tactical suggestions for civil disobedience on the net. Blocking the entrances to a building or some other resistant action in physical space can prevent reoccupation, the flow of personnel. But this is of little consequence so long as information capital continues to flow. The authors muse on what the ideal group pursuing electronic civil disobedience actions might look like. Activist, theorist, artist, hacker, and even a lawyer would be a good combination of tactics. With this document, Critical Art Ensemble demonstrated a shift of focus from the theoretical to the practical. Only a year later, CAE member Ricardo Dominguez would be involved in the birth of a group very similar to the one described in Electronic Civil Disobedience and Other Unpopular Ideas. On December 22, 1997, 45 members of a pacifist political group affiliated with the EZLN, known as Las Abeas, or the Bees, were massacred at a Monday prayer meeting in the small village of Actiel in the Mexican state of Chiapas. The attack was claimed by a right-wing paramilitary group called Mascara Roja, or the Red Mask, although the Mexican authorities had been conspicuously absent during the hours-long attack. Nearby soldiers had not bothered to intervene, and this attack was seen by many as a government-endorsed warning to the EZLN and their supporters. The Actial massacre provided the impetus for the decision by the artists, technologists, students and activists who were to make up the Electronic Disturbance Theatre to formalise their group with its stated aim of highlighting injustices through electronic civil disobedience with New York as its physical nerve centre. The original four members of the Electronic Disturbance Theatre were Ricardo Dominguez, Carmen Karasic, Stefan Ray and Brett Stalbaum. 
As a necessary part of the political statement they wanted to make, they avoided anonymity in favour of personal transparency, no master pseudonyms. This immediately separated them from the various arcane hacker handles and outlandish group names that populated this period in the hacktivism scene. The lack of leet speak pseudonyms wasn't the only thing that set them apart from their contemporaries, though. When I spoke to Carmen as part of my research into EDT, she recalled the surprise she encountered from people who expected a white teenage boy, the hacker stereotype that has long endured, but found themselves instead speaking to a black woman who had coded denial of service tools to enable online protests. Electronic Disturbance Theatre members were unquestionably older, more academic, fiercely political and diverse than most of their peers. Carmen created not just captivating digital artwork for EDT campaigns, but along with Brett Stahlbaum, provided the technical expertise and coding chops necessary to conceive a flood net, and then gradually improve upon its initial design. I think if you're going to make some sort of political statement in cyberspace, it should be a collective statement. It should be a statement that is not just my opinion, but a statement that's multiple thousands of people's opinion. Ricardo Dominguez and Stefan Ray handled more of the organizational and messaging side of the group, engaging with the media through interviews and bombastic press releases, where the Zippies and Strano networks communicated through Usenet, the EDT would speak more directly with legacy media. On January 18th, 1998, a call to online action over the Actial massacre came from net activists in Italy who called themselves the Anonymous Digital Coalition. In a now familiar method of coordination, the word went out on Usenet and various activist and political email lists. This virtual protest on January 29th, 1998, was along the lines of the Strano Network's earlier net strike against the French government, sharing not just the name, but also the technique of encouraging participants to engage in a manual browser refresh style attack. The members of Electronic Disturbance Theater considered how this existing protest methodology inherited from Strano Network and the Anonymous Digital Coalition could be expanded upon and hit on a way to make it even easier for people to participate. Carmen, along with Brett, designed and wrote the code needed to make their concept a reality, and thus FloodNet was born. The idea was a simple one. By navigating Navigating to the FloodNet webpage, users could simply choose a predetermined target from a drop-down list, and then with just another click start the automated refresh operation running against that website. What we wanted to do is create a process by which a large community could gather together and sit down, following the traditions of Thoreau, Gandhi, Martin Luther King, ACT UP, and, and just create a symbolic disturbance based on the weight of that community. Que vale. Que viva Chiapas. Que viva México! Que viva Zapata! There are times when the human community in the flesh has to stand on the superhighway for a brief period of time, like any uh, civil disobedience, and say, ya basta, enough is enough. Participants could specifically request non-existent web pages, such as justice or peace, which would then create a sort of symbolic record of these errors and requests in the targeted server's web access logs. EDT stated that these symbolic log file messages were in fact the aim of FloodNet, not slowing access or preventing connections to the targeted servers, which would be merely an unintended consequence of this protest. FloodNet needed hosting though. This protest could not simply consist of anonymous emails to mailing lists and Usenet posts, or had to be associated web infrastructure. If there's one thing I've learned by watching hacktivists over the years, it is that with more infrastructure comes more actual and potential problems. Stefan Ray agreed to host FloodNet on his New York University student website. So the stage beckoned. EDT needed a public platform to put on a performance that could capture not just the audience's attention, but their participation and support as well. The 1998 Ars Electronica Festival in Austria had as its theme that year, Infowar. It must have seemed like serendipity at the time. In advance of the festival that was to take place in early September, the EDT crafted a press release to go out to reporters on August 25th. Three targets were chosen for the September 9th Swarm or Stop the War in Mexico Floodnet action to take place for 24 hours. In Mexico, Floodnet will target Zadio's website, an obvious choice and one we have made before. In the United States, Floodnet will target the Pentagon, also an obvious choice given the level of US military and intelligence involvement in Mexico. And in Germany, Floodnet will target the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, as Germany is a major player in the global neoliberal economy. Ricardo and Stefan were to take active part in Floodnet live from the Ars Electronica Festival itself. On the day of the swarm protest, Stefan received an email from New York University, which eventually led to EDT moving their site to a dedicated domain. We have received a recent complaint from someone within the DISA of the DOD regarding the ECD website you are maintaining on your page. As you know, freedom of speech is a vital part of the academic process and is one to which we are dedicated, just as we are to ensure that NYU is a good network citizen. What Stefan did not know, but we can now see from the FBI Freedom of Information documents relating to FloodNet, was that the day after the Pentagon swarm protest, the DOD contacted NYU for a second time. A letter was sent by someone from the US government to NYU, which was interpreted by the university as a request for a tape freeze, which I take to mean retention of data backups on university systems that related to Stefan Ray and EDT. FBI documents from late November of 1998 detail this cooperation between New York University, the Defense Information Systems Agency, and the FBI to surveil Ray and his activities on university systems, 
including all of his files and emails. Back to the day of the protest, though. Within around four hours of Floodnet launching, participants started reporting that they were unable to take part because of computer issues. Systems running Floodnet in their browsers were crashing suddenly and unexpectedly. The day after Swarm, September 10th, 1998, Wired published an article by Neil Mackay headlined, Pentagon Deflects Web Assault. This article contains a quote from Defense Department spokesperson Susan Hansen, which constitutes the closest thing to an admission of a counterattack that the Pentagon would make. Our support personnel were aware of this planned electronic civil disobedience attack and were able to take appropriate countermeasures. A FOIA document from the now defunct U.S. National Infrastructure Protection Center, or NIPC, dated 15th of October 1998, gives us one version of the Pentagon counterattack, along with concerns as to the legality of it. A defense news article by George I. Seffers features heavily in the discussion at the NIPC. The article indicates the participants used a computer mini-application, or applet, to set up the participants' computers to dial and redial a Pentagon website, DefenseLink. The sheer volume of requests was intended to shut down the server supporting DefenseLink. The EDT posted their intentions on the internet, which allowed the Department of Defense to receive warning and counter the protest. According to Redacted, the Pentagon placed on its website an applet that activated whenever Floodnet was detected, which shut down the participants' internet browsers. Concerns were raised internally about the legality of the Pentagon electronic counterattack itself. On 10 the Department of Justice was contacted regarding the actions of DOD, and their opinion was that the DOD may have committed a misdemeanor violation by their actions, and that DOJ would contact the DOD General Counsel's Office and advise them to discontinue the DOD actions. On 10 a DOJ representative advised that DOD was questioning why the FBI did not have the EDT under investigation. DOJ has not furnished any opinion concerning the actions of the EDT. I believe that in expressing a legal opinion regarding the actions of Pentagon computer security engineers, but without any emphatic legal position on the Electronic Disturbance Theater's actions, DOJ gave the investigation into EDT the kiss of death. The Pentagon simply would not want to risk legal exposure for what some saw as extra-legal internet vigilanteism carried out against protesters by the U.S. military. It was all a convenient lie of omission or complete technical misunderstanding on the part of U.S. authorities, though. The Pentagon did not, in fact, ever intend to cause Floodnet members' computers to freeze. They allowed this story to flourish, though, with big worded non-denials and a wink and a nod while privately stressing over potential legal exposure as a result of the unintended consequences of thwarting the DDoS traffic. Perhaps the officials in charge of drafting a formal statement on Floodnet at the Pentagon had no understanding of the technology involved and believed that there really had been a deliberate hostile response. Maybe the Pentagon was happy to float the concept of electronic countermeasures against protesters and allow misconceptions to linger in order to see how the notion would be received by the public and other government agencies. An actual U.S. Defense Technical Information Center official who was in involved in formulating the U.S. military response to Floodnet explains what really happened in one of the FBI FOIA documents. The Reuters News, Pentagon Beats Back Internet Attack, Thursday, September 10th, 1998, indicated that the Pentagon struck back at the cyber attackers, forcing them to reboot their computers. Since the counterattack had not been our intent, we were curious to know why this was reported. We tested the Java applet by the Electronic Disturbance Theater against our site and discovered that it opened hundreds of windows on the desktop computer, necessitating a reboot. This behavior may have been triggered by the DTIC system's response to the applet. DTIC did not write any Java applet, contrary to the Reuters story. I think that DTIC had looked at peculiarities in web traffic coming from Floodnet. I suspect the lack of a .mil referring webpage or other similar traces and log files were used to divert incoming Floodnet traffic and had blocked incoming traffic from Austria entirely, which was presumably coming from the Ars Electronica Festival. It was this attempt to redirect and block the incoming Floodnet traffic that unintentionally caused a cascade of new browser windows, presumably one for each request made from that computer via Floodnet. Computers in 1998 would not have handled multiple browser windows very well, inevitably resulting in a system crash that necessitated a system reboot. The Electronic Disturbance Theater with a different roster still exists to this day and Floodnet was open sourced to be used by various groups for online protest. Strano Network, Electronic Disturbance Theater and similar groups that bridged academia, the rapidly blooming digital art scene and the political fringes of the hacker underground provide us a vibrant snapshot of activist politics of the early adopter internet. One of the things that um, cyberspace does is it brings individual power to anyone who cares to learn the technology. If you want to do it, you can do it. And that's the sort of leveling of the playing field that I'm sure really scares the hell out of governments. Because we basically put the tools in these individuals' hands to do whatever they want with them, and we're able to mobilize people at a global level at a moment's notice. So what events in hacker history have we not covered yet that you think is vital? What hacker-related TV shows and movies can we simply not miss out on? The more obscure the better. Hit the comments with some suggestions for future episodes. And if you want to help this channel grow, simply share the content with people you think might be interested. That's it. Thanks for watching and please subscribe so you can keep an eye out for future episodes.